Welcome to Influence, the show about one of the university's founding colleges, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. I'm your host, Emily Shaw. On today's episode, we're going to learn more about precision agriculture at Mississippi State University, and our guest is Dr. Amelia Fox, an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Fox. Thank you for having me, Emily. I'm excited to hear more, and I know that lots of people are familiar with the phrase precision agriculture, yes. but I'm not sure that everyone fully understands all that it encompasses. How about you to give us your definition and, and what it really means? Well, it's a relative term. Okay. So to some who are growing up in developing countries, the most precise tool they have is a hoe. Great point. And, uh, so it really depends on the tools that you have. Okay. In America, we have computer-aided agriculture. Okay. And that computer-aided agriculture can work on the ground or in the air. Mm -hmm. And it can help us make decisions about how to uh, treat a crop mm -hmm. or an animal crop mm -hmm. with uh, the right treatment at the right place at the right time okay. at the right rate. Okay. So the goal is to become more efficient in agriculture mm -hmm through computer-based technologies. And, okay. and that doesn't discount the hoe. The mm -hmm. hoe is still very valuable. Take uh, the, um, the case of pigweed. Mm -hmm. Basically, although we have all sorts of sprays that have, um, uh, the pigweed has become resistant to, we farmers are, are, have to go out and pull the, the leads anyway. So um, precision agriculture is really just a matter of employing the best tools to get the best product with the least amount of input um, at the and the most efficient process possible. Excellent. And here in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, what would be our current approaches to precision agriculture? Well, um, in uh, many of the schools, excuse me, the departments, uh, there is an effort to to engage those computer technologies on different levels. Mm -hmm. So it could be planting, mm -hmm. uh, mid crop assessment, uh, that could be fl uh, flown or a uh, tractor based. Um, it can be replanting after a, a poor stand count. Mm -hmm. It uh, has a lot in my research to do with um, variable rate nitrogen sensing. Okay. We look at early crops and try to assess their, their canopy status mm -hmm. and how much nitrogen they need to finish the season so they can have a second dose at the right rate. Um, estimating yield is going to be very important as we um, move into the future and we have to know that the mm -hmm. crops are going to give us the, th the result that we need uh, mid-season. And then finally harvesting, um, best harvesting practices, um, mechanical, and then uh, taking the data from the harvester and returning that back into the analytical system and deciding how to change our practices in the future. Excellent. So I, I would say every department is doing something mm -hmm. on the basis of precision egg, and the, the real goal is trying to bring us all together. My work encompasses adding flight into the system, but the research that's coming out now suggests that we're moving to both ground and flown systems. Okay. Uh, they have to be able to communicate simultaneously. They will be autonomous, so we will have autonomous tractors mm -hmm. working in tandem with uh, autonomous flight systems. And how do we teach a new generation of individuals to not only fly and drive those autonomously, mm -hmm. but how to build them, repair them, keep them in service? Uh, that's my new challenge. Um, it's, it's a busy time. So you work a lot with what many people know as drones and mm -hmm. we know as unmanned aerial vehicles. That's right. Why don't you tell us about your work with the UAVs? Okay. Um, I got involved with flight uh, when I lived in Washington State. Mm -hmm. I was trained by uh, some recreational pilots that were former uh, Gulf War veterans. Oh, yeah. They didn't have planes to fly any longer. Mm -hmm. So they taught me to fly on manned as uh, recreational, but I realized immediately the application uh, for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And when I moved here uh, with the help of CALS, Dr. Willard and Dr. Berger, we were able to push through a, a flight program. It was supported by GRI. So um, now we're training students to fly. Um, we're also training them to build drones from scratch. They Excellent. order the parts, uh, they bring them in and put them together. Um, but again, our, 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 our goals in the future are to transcend just aerial and mm -hmm. uh, connect it directly to ground activities. Um, another effort is, is we are teaching by the seat of our pants. Mm -hmm. We don't know why students learn to fly. Mm -hmm. Some fly are easier than others. Okay. 
And so my new research will actually be in pedagogy to understand how we teach flight. Okay. Uh, taking what I learned years ago from mm -hmm. these veterans mm -hmm. and bringing it forward. It's an excellent teaching method. There's nothing wrong with the teaching mm -hmm. method, but why it works is unknown. Okay. So a new, a new form of research will come out of this. Okay, excellent. So when you teach, you teach in the classroom, you teach in the computer lab, you teach in the field. Can you talk to us about the, the differences or, or the parts that you like bo most about that? Each uh, form of teaching, each mode of teaching is enjoyable. Um, teaching in the field is demanding and exhausting at times. Uh, teaching in the classroom can uh, be um, wonderful because students pick up aha moments and theories mm -hmm. that they've never uh, grasped or consumed before. Um, we have a new project going over at CAVS, at the mm -hmm. Center for Advanced Vehicular Systems, in which we're building virtual reality oh. training tools for high-risk agriculture. Uh, there are some things we can't teach in the classroom or in the field. They're just too risky and dangerous. Sure. And so CAVS is building virtual reality tools for that as well. Um, I, I like every facet, and I'm very fortunate that the teaching is so varied from day to day that we're never doing just one thing. Excellent. So when we come back, we'll speak more about precision agriculture and especially how we utilize undergraduate students in that work. Think you know egg? Think again. We are creative. We protect the environment. We prepare for careers in medicine and conduct research. We empower people and communities. We are technology driven. And we feed and clothe the world. the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Mississippi State University. Imagine a car designed to travel 100 miles on a single gallon of gas. Engineered to lead the way in energy independence. It will inspire you to rethink how cars actually work. Imagine the car of the future. We are at Mississippi State University, where we ring true. Welcome back to Influence. Today we're learning more about precision agriculture in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences with Dr. Amelia Fox. So Dr. Fox, I know that you work a lot with undergraduate students, not just teaching them, like as we said before the break, in the classroom, in the computer lab, in the field. How do you utilize undergraduate students and, and take them beyond, quote, the classroom experience? That's a really good question. Um, undergraduate students uh, qualify for the undergraduate research program mm -hmm. in which we can teach them uh, how to apply the flight uh, data analysis in a real world situation. Okay. The, the critical thing to think about here is um, students come to us, uh, I like to think of them as having been formed in a cave, a place where they, they, they know their world around them, they're comfortable, but we, we take them out of the cave and push them into the light, where I ask them to go into the light, okay. where they're blinded by the realities that surround them. They're oftentimes overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And what's worse is uh, they, they can look at things and see them for the first time for what they really are okay. and seem totally confused. Uh, our job is to guide them to the knowledge, but we can only teach what we know. We right. can't teach something we don't know. Right. And so we ask them to transcend what we teach them and show us knowledge created through their own eyes. 
uh, and, and increase the body of knowledge. We f tell them first that they're standing on the shoulders of giants, but then we ask them to become a giant. It is a frightening proposition for them. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting mm -hmm. because they would just as soon be living in that cave-like world where they're comfortable and everything is dark and seems to be what they think it is. Um, it's very philosophical in a sense, mm -hmm. but we must take them out into the light and let them struggle through it. So some students find out that they weren't natural pilots mm -hmm. at first, but they can fly. Okay. They can fly. And as these systems become more and more autonomous, we give them the confidence that they have to be able to pilot safely, but the computer can do a lot of the work for them. So we have a few pictures of, um, I believe, three, three of your students sure. who have um, been learning flight. And if you'll kind of talk us through these. Sure, this is Addison Meeks. He is my undergraduate researcher this semester. And Addison is an ace pilot. He trained in my uh, first flight course and then the second flight course and then went on to work for the Geosystems Research Institute as a pilot. Excellent. So he's going back to his farm in Tennessee. He'll be graduating this semester and it's a, it's a highlight. Excellent. And our other two students? Uh, this is Nolan Parker on the right and Lucas Whittenton on the left. Lucas has returned to the family farm. Nolan is my graduate student. He is an ace pilot. He can fly fixed and quad. Um, this is a, a flight trainer out on the south farm um, at uh, Mississippi State University. Uh, early morning flight training. And uh, Nolan um, has had the, the fortune to be uh, volunteering at RASPIT, the research uh, flight laboratory. Uh, he will become a man pilot shortly, and um, piloting is a big part of his life. He'll be studying variable rate nitrogen sensing using these technologies, and just this morning he received a grant that he wrote uh, to fund his research Excellent. in research, um, uh, flight research. Excellent. So we have the Precision Agriculture Certificate available, but right. not all students who complete that certificate would be becoming pilots, is that correct? Yeah, it's not a requirement at all. There is a question as to whether or not it should be okay. considered a part of the core program. Mm -hmm. The difficulty with that is I can only take 10 students gotcha. at a time. Unless we have another pilot trainer that mm -hmm. can work in the field, mm -hmm. Um, I can only take 10 students a semester. That's actually a pretty heavy load. Okay. So uh, we have to figure out a way to make a sustainable system of this and reach uh, more people. There are 150 aeronautical universities in the school and we are not one. We yeah. do not teach aeronautics. If one of those 150 uh, programs graduated 500 students a year, mm -hmm. we might meet the, wow. the demand. So we have a, an onerous burden to get to that. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing with us today. I realize we could still spoon up more knowledge in this area, but we've, we've taken our best shot at it today. So thank you thank for you. joining us on Influence and learning more about precision agriculture with Dr. Amelia Fox in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. We'll see you next time.